And then we invited people in their individual capacities normally, not as representatives of their organizations. So they would be freer to make their own determinations, not feel they were mandated or had to refer back. Now that was a little bit different in the case of the rebel organizations, where we had to rely upon the choice of the leader, whoever he sent. But everywhere else, it was people were there in their individual capacities. <laughs> Take care. Um, finally, uh, my concluding slide. Um, these are the key lessons that I've come away from in the course of doing this work. First, we've got to begin to address and find strategies and procedures, processes, to deal with the attitudinal dimension of post-conflict reconstruction. With what's in people's heads, their perceptions, their values, their suspicions, etc. If you don't do that, you're not dealing with the core material. We need a much more holistic approach to peace building and, and need to engage leaders in long-term training. I've already talked about the importance of expanding the notion of capacity building. And finally, you need the synergy between diplomats and trainers. When I used to talk about this stuff in the abstract uh, at the State Department before I launched the program, eyes would glaze over. And people, I just knew people were thinking, oh, gee, he's just one of these you know, feely, touchy kinds of folks. None of this is really relevant to real, real politics, the hard-nosed politics. Our breakthrough came when one of these guys, a very dear friend of mine, who was the typical cynical diplomat who, who accepted the idea of seeing how this would work only because he trusted me, didn't, didn't, have, a, didn't have any confidence in what I was proposing really, saw the impact of our first two workshops in Kinshasa in the Congo and then wrote back home a cable in terms of the, what happened following that, those workshops, in terms of concrete behavioral changes, initiatives, et cetera, that were taken. And so I used to go to the State Department, even when I had left the department, would have me come in periodically to do briefings on the Congo and on Burundi. And when I came back in to do a briefing uh, after this letter had gone the certain rounds at the State Department, the attitude and the sensibilities of people around that table were so different. They finally were paying attention. And I felt so good when the Secretary Clinton invited me to come back into the department, having supported Obama, I wasn't sure that was going, that was going to happen. Uh, but when she said to me in my initial meeting with her, she wanted me to explain more fully how this worked and what we were up to. And then she said to me, she wanted to combine this mode of transformative conflict transformation with conventional diplomacy. And the State Department this year has uh, just awarded a million dollars to the Wilson Center to begin training the Congolese Army High Command in the same way that we have worked with the Burundian High Command. So now you're beginning to get this accepted as a reasonable thing to do. Still got a ways to go, a lot of folks still don't get it, don't understand it. But it's been very, very exciting. I'd love to share with you some of the techniques. Of it. it's, they're kind of fun. But let me stop here, opened up for questions. Thank you. OK, and could I get some more water? Yeah. Question. So you won't get so dry. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. So a, a question to start with. Um, so the election five years ago was very successful, but the recent election was not as successful and things are um, in a deteriorating state. So how is that related to who's involved at the moment and things like that? Yeah, there's a lot of political chaos in Burundi at the moment. But there's some things that are very distinctive about this situation compared to the, where we were. When I came into Burundi, the first time was in 1995 when the National Democratic Institute asked me to go in for a few days to see if things had become too dangerous 
for them to maintain their national, their, their office there in Burundi. It was the scariest experience I've ever had. When I was there during those four days, politicians were being assassinated every day in the streets. I was staying with the uh, ambassador at his residence, and every night you could hear gunfire off the hills of Burundi. You could not use the words Hutu and Tutsi. It was too sensitive. If you even suggested the idea of negotiations, that was traitorous behavior. If you go into Burundi today, notwithstanding this political chaos and confusion, which should not have happened and which could have been averted easily had some people done some things differently, I can go into that if you want, but let me put that aside for a second. You will find that despite this political chaos and the um, boycotting of the election by several political parties and so on, and their claim that it wasn't a legitimate election when it really it was, no, nowhere has the Tutsi Hutu dichotomy reemerged. Now that is stunning, given the fact that for decades people were engaged in a life and death struggle of genocide and intercommunal massacres, and today the Hutu Tutsi issue is gone under the table. I mean, it just is not there. Um, it's now Hutu Hutu conflict. It's, a, it's among people competing for a position among the Hutu population. Uh, all personality driven, positions driven, nothing to do with ideology or anything else. Uh, that's number one. A still? A little, but not, not significant. A lot of banditry, a lot of guns in the population. And there is some concern that the FLN may be rearming itself in the Congo, but those reports are not at all clear yet. Um, but it's nothing like it was before. And if you go into the city, there's a sense of normalcy. People go about their business, the car the traffic is, congestion is horrible. There was a time when you never see a car on the road, it was like a ghost town. Uh, people are getting married every weekend in the big public festival fashion. Um, I mean, it's just a sense of normalcy, except for this political piece of the inter-party relationships. Um, and thirdly, and this in some ways is the most significant thing of all, is that this Burundian army has emerged as one of the most cohesive on the African continent. Um, I was introducing, uh, I was in Burundi some months ago, and I was introducing the new ambassador to Burundi to the Minister of Defense, who was this incredible, he had been the chief of staff when I began this program of the army. And he was one of these remarkable people of vision and risk-taking who instantly saw the value of what, I, of what I was proposing, even though I, he didn't know me from Adam, and sanctioned his top generals in participating in the program. He himself took the training. And uh, unsolicited, he said to the ambassador that the success they have enjoyed in the army, and everyone will acknowledge this army now, people used to be scared of the army. It was a tool and instrument of, of repression. In this last election, people wanted the army there, not the police, because the police haven't become quite as professional yet. They wanted the army there. Um, he said that success is attributable entirely to the training our people have received, this training. And he wants it to be expanded to lower ranks in many different directions. Um, in fact, one of the things we did in the election, uh, there was a huge competition between the army and the police. They had to work together to provide security for the election. So we took, uh, the president asked me to do this. We took all the, uh, the top commanders from the police and the army and put them into this kind of training process to build cohesion. And the election security came off without, uh, not even a squeak, I mean, it was just, all us. And so, uh, yeah, so I think those are pretty significant things. Now having said that, if the government can't sort itself out politically and the economy is so terrible, obviously we can get politicians beginning again to manipulate ethnicity for their own purposes. But right now, Burundi is nothing short of a miracle story on the continent. And it's recognized as that by those who followed this over the years.
Mr. Walby, question right here. Uh, I was wondering if you could take us into the meeting room in an example where you have, as you described, some rebel military commanders and governmental military commanders. Arm guards are outside the door. People are, as you put it, catatonic. They're angry with each other. They're afraid of each other. What do you do? What do you do in that first hour? <laughs> Um, I'll, I'll tell you exactly what we did. I mean, this is Ngozi, the very workshop I was describing. And um, we began by a little introductions exercise. But the people who couldn't introduce themselves, they had to introduce someone else. And it had to be someone they did not previously know. So we forced them to get up from their chairs and move around the room, find people they didn't know interview each other for a few moments, and then we began the introductions. The, the highlight for me was this one moment when um, there was a very attractive woman who was being introduced, and she was introduced, and someone spoke up and she said, hey fellas, how did it go? Oh, they turned to Father Astaire, the Catholic priest, and said, you know, she's single. <laughs> But it just broke the ice. I mean, it was just some kind of joshing back and forth. But then the first exercise we did was one that scared hell out of me, but boy, did it work. I never seen this before. This was new to me. We had the trainers ask the participants to grab a hold of the arm of whoever they were sitting next to and to play a game. The game was very simple. They were supposed to try to get as many points for themselves as possible. They didn't have to worry about how many points the other guy got, but they wanted to get as many points for themselves as they could. And every time their partner's hand touched the table, they would get a point. And every time their hand touched the table, their partner would get a point. So we got them started and gave them about 45 seconds to, to do this. We stopped the exercise. And we asked people to report their scores. And most people had, you know, zero, they didn't move, or one or two points. One couple had 10 points each. And people were stunned. And they turned to this couple and said, how did you guys get 10 points each? Well, it turned out that this couple it was a, a Tutsi general, one of these guys I mentioned, and a Catholic Hutu nun. And she explained that, you know, that she quickly figured out she wasn't going to beat this guy in a test of strength. So she suggested to the general that if they do it this way, they both can come out ahead by collaborating. And he saw it too and agreed. And so we were able, using this little exercise, to get them into um, the testing of assumptions. No one has said anything about arm wrestling. We never used that word. We never said anything about arm wrestling. But everyone assumed it was an arm wrestle. And that now they suddenly understood that they had gotten trapped by their assumptions. And that had they collaborated, they both would have come out ahead. <laughs>